Hi everyone, this is Tim Von Rieden and I'm about to get started. I'm just doing the final marketing push here for this live stream. But for today's live stream, we're going to be going through the first part of our shape challenge exercise. So I'm going to be taking a look at the first two, which will be the one on the farthest left and then the one on the middle left. And the reason I split this up is because then we'll work on these two today. And then next week's live stream, I'll finish it off with the third and fourth one. And like I said, this exercise is not meant to further any of your skills. Mine, well, maybe, maybe if you've never worked with this kind of a challenge before, but it's mostly supposed to get you thinking and you Let's try that again. There we go. Okay. So for those of you just joining, we're going to be doing our shape challenge exercise for our live stream today. I'm going to be looking at the far left two today. And like I was saying before I got cut off on the weird, I don't know what happened with Google Hangout just now, but pretty much this is supposed to test your creative side and take the skills that you have and apply it to a random shape challenge. And it's supposed to make you think in a way that you wouldn't normally because you're given a preset look at uh, different line art and you're supposed to create something out of these pre-given shapes. So the cool part is, is you kind of don't have to worry so much about the actual like shape and sizing of whatever it is you're going to create, but rather you have to focus on what you're going to create inside of those lines. And that's what the fun part is. So really quick, I'm going to go ahead and move all of my other windows out of the way. I know you can't see them, but I have a lot of distracting windows open right now. Too many emails ready to send that i got to postpone while I do the live stream here. Okay. So I always see that the, the users always do a good response when we do these shape challenges, and I think it's because they're a fun way to practice your skill set without having too much pressure on it. So what I'm going to be doing is let's just go ahead, let's see here. So I'm going to make a new layer underneath the shape one. And pretty much I'm just going to go ahead and just start sketching out an idea. So right away I see that it's a wider block and then it has this weird sort of shape up here that I'm going to have to play with. Now for each all four of these, I wanted to do like an animated looking character, and I kind of want to stick to that challenge, so it's like a challenge within itself. So rather than this just being some random weird shape object, I'm going to go ahead and try to turn this into a character itself. And I know that wasn't part of the exercise rules at all, so if you want to make them all like creatures or dinosaurs or whatever it may be, you are more than welcome to do so. It just for myself, I want to do animated characters, because I've sort of found a love for them recently. And uh, to be honest, oops, we got to make sure I have the Q&A open too. And if you want to do comments, I'll leave the Twitch page open as well for comments. But I think from now on, we're going to be using Google Hangout page, or the Google Hangout live stream. So if you want to ask questions, you're more than free to on the Q&A sections. And you can pull that up. If you hover over the left side of the live stream, there's a Q&A tab. And pretty much you just click it, and then you ask your questions. And I think that is as easy as it is. I've watched a few live streams where they did that, and it was pretty cool. But I know I kind of missed the live conversation as well. So maybe, who knows, maybe Google Hangout will add that feature sometime in the future. But for now, we're going to stick with the Q&A. And if you have any questions, just leave them there. All right, so back to the drawing. Um, so for this first one, I'm sur sort of seeing like this chubby set man, let's see here. And the fun part is almost laying down some shapes and then kind of seeing where that takes you. So this is almost looking like a Fred Flintstone rendition or something. So something I rarely do is draw eyes that are beady or eyes that aren't that appealing. And I think because I have such a fixation on eyes that I always try to make them over-beautified and I really add most of the rendering and 
Um, for once, I want to try not focusing so much on that, but rather on the actual coloring technique overall. And man, as I'm drawing this, this is definitely uh, a very plain looking guy. And this weird quaff that he has going up here, I'm going to actually keep it the way it is. So you can see how something so simple as a face like this will be able to work with the given um, shape outline. Let's see, I'm thinking on whether or not I want to give them bigger eyes or if I'm really going to keep these itty little bitty eyes that we got going on. And I'm actually pretty okay with them. And then for um, the second sketch here, what I like to do is I, I try to work with laying down a sketch quickly and then, then doing the slow, monotonous task of coloring it. But usually when I'm in the sketching phase, I like to work fast. And I, for something like this, I try not to overthink things. So for this one, I almost immediately see a helmet on top of the head here. So I'm going to go ahead and add almost like a baseball helmet. And that, those come down like like this, or somewhat like that. That's a poor rendition of a baseball helmet. Partially because I only played baseball as a kid, so I probably don't have the best memory for what they look like exactly. You know what? I don't like that lip here. I'm just going to make it a normal helmet because this side then would have to have the same uh, lip that comes down, but since I don't, I can't add to the shape. I can only play with the pre-given outline. I'm going to go ahead and avoid doing that. So I think it'd be kind of cool if this was like a little kid wearing this oversized helmet, and he's got like this big, almost like what you see in like the Russian those heavy coats. I don't know what he's doing with this helmet on. Maybe he's like playing pretend. Oh, okay, now the questions are coming in. Um, where, I, where am I from? So I am originally from Wisconsin, uh, from I guess from the United States, and I've been moving around for work. I moved down to Chicago, Illinois for a while but only recently did I move back to Wisconsin to work remotely from my uh, parents' house, actually, so I can save some money. And um, uh, But my last name would indicate that I'm from German, but I'm also Germany. I'm German, Irish, and a little bit of Swedish. <laughs> you see a whole person in the sketch? I mean, if you see a whole person in the sketch... That's even cooler, and I think you should go for uh, drawing out the entire character then. I'm just, I'm a really big fan of profile shots, and I think that's why instinctively I almost am drawn to that. You know what, maybe I'll just make all my characters have this, these little beady eyes. I don't know if that makes it easier for you guys to see. Um, you know what? No, this character's not going to have beady eyes. I want this one to look a little darker.
almost like he has something planned. Just looks devious in general. <laughs> Drowned profiles, no pun intended. This almost reminds me of like, if you guys have ever seen Courage the Cowardly Dog, this reminds me of the cat expression from that show. It just looks very ominous and up to no good at all times. Um, do you have any suggestions to those who base their skills on the level of inspiration, and how should I change that habit? Um, okay, wait. To those who base their skills on the level of inspiration, how should I change that habit? I don't think that's a habit you need to change. I'm assuming that is talking about you're basing your inspiration on the level of skill that other artists you're viewing? I'm a little confused by your question. If you could rewrite that, I could probably help out a little more. But I know a lot of artists, and there is this great video that um, one of my friends showed me recently about how if you have a taste for art, your taste might be excellent, but your actual skill level might be you know, not so awesome as to the inspiration and reference pic pictures that you're looking at. And that's actually a good thing. That means that your taste is on par. You just got to get your skill level to match up with that. And that just takes time. That takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of practicing. But eventually you'll get to the level of taste that you, <laughs> you have. Do a little edging on this coat here. Yeah, so I definitely like the the Twitch chat a little better, but I think in terms of Google Hangout, especially with using future um, artists that will be coming onto these live streams, I definitely think it would be better with just a Q&A because then um, as we get more of the well-known artists, I can just redirect the questions that are near the top at them. Okay, and then maybe a little concept cookie sticker on the helmet. Maybe some other stickers here. And just have it be kind of worn. All right, so I'm going to turn that layer's opacity down. Make one layer above it. And I'll try to do a more refined pass for this one. That's true. The first one definitely does need eyebrows. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe we'll give them some big ol' eyebrows. And if you're doing something like with animated characters, I find that using shapes helps a lot in like keeping the basis of shapes in almost any area that you're creating on your character. It just it it's actually more fun to play with 
too. Like that's why I think I've been having so much fun working on characters that are more animated looking, because there's such a focus on shapes. And then when you shade it or you render it, you can have fun um, with that process too, because then it's just like shading different shapes all around your character. I don't want to say it's easier. I would just say it's more fun. Oh, I see. So your level of inspiration in terms of like how inspired you are to draw. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, you'll have those days where you're, you're not really feeling your drawing. And I have those too, where it's like, you know, someday, like one day I'll feel like I just hit a home run with the way that I was drawing. Everything kind of worked together and it, it was awesome. And then the next day it could be the complete opposite. I think those, it's one of those things where you just have to understand that, that that will happen, and rather than getting frustrated, just know that you're having an off day. Like, recognize that, you know, today is just not your day, and that it won't be like that forever. And I think that will help you kind of move along and just get through the day, and then, you know, just put it off until the next day, and then try try your best the next day. Because, at least for me, they never seem to last more than a day where I'm, like, really not feeling it. I've never had, like, two days in a row where I've just been like, oh, man, I am just, you know, not performing at all in digital art. So just just know that you'll have off days, I guess. Okay, now for this kid, I definitely want to give the impression that everything that he's wearing is way too big on him. So I'm imagining one of those huge oversized coats and then like maybe a really big scarf that he has wrapped around him. Like maybe this is one of those kids that sees like what the you know atypical villain looks like on TV or in movies and he's trying to replicate that in his own way <laughs> looks cool like a cucumber. It's one of my favorite expressions. Um, do I do any commissions in traditional? Uh, I would say it's more rare, but definitely when I was in college, I definitely did, I would say like one every three months I would get a traditional commission. And usually, I mean, it was for like a family or a family friend or just someone that found me through DeviantArt, but I would say not so often anymore. And if I do do like uh, realistic commissions where it's like a family photo or something like that, it'll definitely be digital. And I try to make it look like it was hand drawn with a pencil because I think, you know, especially with like people like my parents that don't really understand the whole digital side of things, they like seeing brushworks and they like it looking very traditional and hand drawn. But no, I haven't done uh, a traditional commission in a long time. <laughs> he reminds you of Tommy Pickles. Uh, that is quite the honor, because Tommy Pickles was my hero growing up as a little child myself.
I definitely think this kid's a little more on the evil side, though. Mischievous. You know what? If I zoom in, can you guys see that easier? Oh, yeah, you can see that much easier. You can definitely see my resolution here with all the pixels. But that's okay. I don't need this to be worked on as a high-resolution image. Um, oh, that's... Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, I really hope that, you know, when you don't have your on days, that it doesn't completely destroy you and you start to second guess if you're even good at art. I mean, that's happened to me before where, like, when I have an off day, I just feel really awful about my skill level or where I'm at. And especially when you feel like you can't replicate the really good art that you've been doing recently, then you feel like maybe you got lucky or something happened where, you know, fate aligned, the stars aligned, and you just pulled off this amazing piece, but then you're not able to do it the next day. And then you just feel kind of terrible. And I, I know what that feels like, but... I just I really hope that doesn't discourage you from doing art altogether and then you just stick with it. All right, I think this kid's smile should be No, oh, that not that weird. <laughs> Definitely looking like he's up to no good. <laughs> I don't know who that character is, but I did start One Piece. I didn't get that far, though, but I'm supposed to actually cosplay with a bunch of my friends. I'm supposed to be the chef. So I, Sanji, I believe. But yeah, One Piece has some great proportions. Actually, their villains are some of the coolest looking in terms of proportion and how exaggerated they are. It's actually kind of fun to see what designs they have for each of them. All right, so let's get on to coloring this thing. I've spent too much time trying to etch out shapes on them. So I'm going to make a new layer. Now I'm going to change the circle hard edge brush that I've been using, and I'm going to make it the hardness, if you can see that. Um, all you do, and this is on a Mac. I believe it's a little different on PC. But if you hold Control and Option and then press down on your tablet, if you move left to right, that'll change the size of your brush rather quickly, and it's actually the only way I change the size of my brush. But then if you go up or down on the tablet, it changes the hardness of your brush. And that's a really quick and easy thing if you want to change the hardness or the size of your brush. And that's actually one of the one of the best tricks I think I learned to save me time and energy, really, um, rather than using your left hand to use the brackets. And you can just keep it in the bottom left corner. So I'm sure this is just one of my phases that I get into, but recently I like using the hard, or the soft edge brush to kind of lay out um, the features. And that could be either the skin or the hair, whatever it may be. Because then let's say like I do a new layer, and then I lay out his hair. then I could quickly take my eraser tool and edge it off. And if I can't see the original outline, I'll just lower that layer's opacity like I just did with the brown, and then erase it. And this is one of those methods of um, 
where you're destroying rather than just creating. And I, I hear people talk about this a lot where some artists refuse to use the erasure tool, but rather grab the colors and add to it like they would a traditional painting. And there's pros and cons to both ways of doing things. I'm actually, I don't prefer one or the other. I just feel like whatever mood I'm in is the one that I'll use for that painting. But I don't see any problem with sometimes using the eraser tool to erase or, as they would say, delete part of the image. And I think as long as you're getting the results that you're looking for, it doesn't matter what method you're using. As long as it's a method that is, you know, time efficient and is and produces results. So and lastly, let's give him, he is definitely an ordinary guy, let's just give him a blue looking, blue collar. Maybe just a lighter blue tie. What's going on down here? And sometimes I'll even save the erasing toward the end, but sometimes, I don't know why, for live streaming I like to make it look pretty all the way from start to finish. And that's kind of a bad habit to get into. So really, I mean, if it looks sloppy the first quarter, half of the time that you're working on a piece, that's okay, because as long as the finished result looks, you know, awesome, that's what really matters. And I think too many artists worry about cleaning it up the entire way through, but sometimes you just got to have fun with having that freedom of um, letting it look a little off during some parts of the process or not as complete. And let's give him... So I'm going to play with some colors here on the side. So if you haven't heard me... Um, praise James Gurney's book Color and Light as many times as I, I do. I'm going to do it again and for this time there's something that he talks about in his book where he talks about the face having color regions and it's something that I, I love and I almost apply to almost all of my pieces that I do and he talks about how the center area of the face has more of a red tint to it and he talks about why the reasoning is that and sometimes how the nose, the blood vessels, and why the, the hue and the tint of the color is more reddish. And then he talks about how on the forehead it's generally more yellow tinted. And he doesn't go like crazy yellow, but just like a, a hint of the yellow. And then for the area below the mouth, or almost like below the nose, I guess, has more of a bluish tint. And you'll see this a lot, especially with... Uh, older men, and especially when it looks like they just shaved that morning and it, some of that hair, that bristle is coming back. It's like that 5 o'clock shadow almost. And it leaves almost this blue looking impression. So I'm going to play with that here. Yeah, so actually in the comments, someone, that's what it's called, destructive editing. And I agree that as long as you're getting the result that you're looking for, I don't really think it matters what technique you're using. And I don't see using the eraser tool as like this big taboo. Let's see here. I'm going to... Just give more of an outline to my mouth and nose before I lose it with all the coloring we're doing on top of it.
All right, now for his cheeks, I'm just going to make them a tad more rosy. And I don't want you to feel afraid to mix colors, especially when you think um, a lot of the pieces you may look at, especially when they're animated, it may only look like they used a few colors for the entire, especially skin region. But it actually helps if you uh, work with playing with a bunch of different colors. And that's not to say that you should go overboard, but that means that you shouldn't be afraid to pull in colors that maybe you normally wouldn't. So for like the ear, this is one of those things where you'll you'll see subsurface scattering, and that's when you use uh, your pinks and your light yellows to make it look as if the light is passing through the ear from the other side. It's a cool technique, but you wouldn't normally think of using you know the saturated pink to be using inside of the ear. So like I said, I'm just having fun with this character. I'm not putting too much emphasis of, on making him look a certain way or trying to make him fit in a particular role. I'm just going to have fun with coloring it, and I think that's really the foundation of the challenge this week, or of the next two weeks, I should, I should say, with the shape challenge. And I think that's something that you should look into if you decide to go ahead and do this uh, shape challenge as well. All right, so now I'm going to start adding more contrast to what I'm working with here. So in areas like the corner of the mouth, that's definitely going to be an area of shadow that's right above it. And then the contrast will be the lip area that's underneath of it. So right here and here, it's almost as if from like a side view, there's like a bump where the cheek is, and then the lip is bringing it out. So if the light was coming from this direction, you can see how the shadow would kind of fall around this thing, but then be completely lit on that side. And this is definitely one of those tricks that you can use anywhere where you know there's that sharp contrast between a curved object meeting up against um, an object that's more flat, and it will catch the light almost directly. Then I want sort of like an upper cheek. And maybe have another sharp contrast of where that skin meets up against it. And you can see the difference. I mean, that almost creates that form so strongly. And that's what happens when you have those two hues that meet up against each other like that. And uh, the more that you work with it, the more fun you'll have with playing and um, pushing it in different areas of your piece. Um, this live stream will go until probably a little after 3. Uh, depending on how long each of these take me, I'm definitely going to finish these two. I don't know if they'll be fully rendered, but just enough where I'll feel confident ending it off. Um, yes, I've used Paint Tool Side before, and I, I really like it, but unfortunately, it for me on a Mac, it doesn't seem to work all that well, and it could just be my fault, and I'm blaming Paint Tool Side for something that is actually my, my wrongdoing, but I loved their lazy brush that they have in it, and I know Photoshop, you can download a plugin, but unfortunately, it doesn't work on a Mac OS right now. It only works for PCs. So I'm actually a little jealous on that end, but I'm hoping eventually they'll make the build for it. Just like how the, the new open source painting software Krita, or Krita, however you want to pronounce it, uh, it's right now only a, a PC build, 
And since I have a Mac, I can't really test it out and play with it because I don't want to do um, the dual, whatever that's called, where you can put a PC on it. And I did that in school, and it didn't work too well for me. But like I said, I'm hoping that they create a Mac version build of it so I can go ahead and play with it and tell you guys what I think. Um, did you know about... Did you know you got noticed by... No. Um, so at Blender Game Artist, could you send me the link of how I got noticed from I Draw Girls? That's actually a really big honor. I'm, I love his work. I mean, it's crazy good. So to know that he recognized Concept Cookie would be cool. So then for the eye, I'm just giving it kind of that dubious little shine. I try not to add too much of that white um, in any drawing really anymore. I find that the drawings I really like have a low specularity and they almost let their hues, their true hues, speak for the shape and value of whatever it is they're drawing. The one problem I have with the Q&A on Google Hangouts is that the new ones don't automatically get fed to the top. So I almost have to like scroll through it every five minutes. But anyways, back to drawing, sorry. All right, so now for the skin color, I'm going to mix in some lighter colors. And you can't see my swatches on the stream, but I just have a lot of... Uh, swatches that I saved that I know those colors work well together and then I can pull those in. That doesn't mean that I just directly use those colors so sometimes I'll like pull the colors from my swatches and then mix on the side until I get a color I find appropriate for whatever I'm doing and then lay those on. And for this guy, it's almost a good example of how, even if the subject matter isn't that interesting, because for the most part, this is a pretty generic looking uh, gentleman that we got going on here, but the way that we're coloring them is kind of fun, or at least for me, this is fun. I always found coloring to be my favorite part of concept art. So something like this, like this very large section of skin and the way that the cheeks fold over each other, it's almost more fun to me than something that's crazy like concept art focused, where it would be like even something if it was like a Final Fantasy character. Sometimes I can just get very meticulous with all the detailing. And I mean, I'm not saying that I don't have fun making those, because I definitely do, but uh, they're definitely more time consuming. And I, I almost have more fun playing with colors like on something like this. So in here I'm just going to do a light outline with this lighter color and that will edge off the character a little bit. He noted me on his rendering tutorial and linked yours stating it's much better than his. Uh, that's crazy. I'd have to look into that more. I had no idea. I mean, thank you guys for bringing that to my attention. That's actually really cool. I'm going to send him an email now. I would love to have him on a live stream. I think his art's, like, kick-ass, so maybe if I get in contact with him, he'll agree to doing a live stream here. Now, for the nose, we're pretty much going to do the same technique that we used on the cheek area. So I'm going to push the bottom with this darker red. Round it off. And then to really edge off the nose from the skin part, I'm going to grab the skin color. And when I say grab, that means I'm color picking using the eyedropper tool. But on a Mac and a PC, I believe, all you do is you hold the Alt button I guess on a Mac it's your option. 
and it brings your eyedropper tool. And that lets you color pick from anywhere on your canvas, and I use that all the time, and that's for mixing colors together. And for this reason, it's to edge off the nose here. So you can see as we edge that off. And then I'll blend in that color with the surrounding skin. And you'll, you'll be able to see how that nose then definitely pops out more, just because of the contrast from the hues. Now for the top of the nose, I'm going to actually color pick from the cheek area that we have over here. I'm just going to lay that color right on top. And then I'm going to grab in some of that skin color. I don't want his nose to look too red, like he has a cold or something. Like that. And then usually the areas on the face that produce some kind of a shine, um, it's the most, I guess, specularity, if I want to use that word, and that's usually a word that is uh, used with 3D modeling, but it's pretty much where it reflects light uh, very strongly. So on skin, it's usually the areas that are more oily, which may sound kind of gross, but it's true. So usually like the tip of the nose, somewhere on the nose, it'll be like a really defined speck. So a lot of times you'll see like this. And uh, especially for an animated character, that works really well. And for him, I'm going to actually play that. I'm just going to kind of draw it out since his nose is so ovalish. And then maybe some bounce lighting coming on the bottom here. Really round that out. And I go back and forth all the time on whether or not I find bounce lighting appropriate for an animated character. So sometimes I'm all, or not even an anime character, just in general, where sometimes I'll find myself being like, yeah, that looks really good in this area. And then other times feeling like that's too much, it's almost distracting them. So you got to find that nice balance of when uh, your bounce lighting is distracting or if it's actually helping the composition as a whole. So then here I'm creating another hue contrast, so right here. And that's where this cheek line meets up with the nose. And that's pretty much your smile line. So when you smile, you'll see it. If you look in a mirror, it's the line that pretty much connects your nose to the outside of your lip and then back down. But for him, I don't actually have to draw that line. I can just do it through a uh, hue contrast. And then since I want to bring in some of that blue from like um, the lower face of the region that I was talking about before, about how the face has different color regions, I'm going to pull that up into here. And the more that you do concept art, the more you'll find yourself kind of leaning towards having fun in different areas. So for me, blending colors in the relations between colors are by far the most fun I have when doing concept art. So some people think I have really good rendering skills, but I think, or at least I hope I believe, that I just really love working with color and making those colors work harmoniously together. And I, I definitely recommend uh, playing with colors and finding out you know, what colors do work well together. And then you'll definitely be able to work with ones that you know will work well together. So colors that are like, you know, orange and blue are probably the most overused colors, especially in the cinema industry. But it's overused because of how well it works. And it creates that nice balance of cool and warm. And, I mean, there's so much with color that I, I want to take, like, a class on it. I want to keep continuing learning about color because of how interesting and intriguing I find it. And one of my favorite 
color artist, his name is Ryan Lang, and he currently works, I believe, at Disney Interact or not Interactive. He actually works at Disney for like um, Wreck It Rolf, and he just produced some beautiful work that, I mean, I I can only dream of making someday, and I think it's important. It his colors in his pieces almost tell a story, and I I love that about him, and I love that about his work. So now here, I'm using this darker brown to start edging off some of the hair. It was looking a bit too light to me. I want to play more with a darker brown here. Um, do I suggest working in grayscale first to understand the importance of value or diving straight into colors? So this is actually something that I'm asked a lot, and I'm actually working on a tutorial series right now which talks about um, different methods of starting in concept art. And two of those tutorials, one of them is starting in grayscale first, and then the other one is working in color first. And the difference is working in grayscale first, you definitely get to see the values a lot easier than working with color. So even right now, let's say I made, and you can do this at any time, so at the very bottom of your layers menu, there's like a circle that's cut in half, and if you click and hover over it, you can choose hue and saturation, and then you can change that to zero, and if I turn that layer on and off, you can see the current values I have laid out in my piece. And actually, I think this is something everyone should do if they work in color. And that way you can see how your values are looking. So right now, we got some obvious contrast between like the hair and, oops, I gotta do this on there. The hair and the skin line here. You definitely get some contrast in the cheek and the skin, which is what we were doing with the hue contrast. So contrast doesn't just have to mean in value, it can also mean with your hues and with your saturation, which people don't know either. So let's say you have a piece that is very desaturated. If you have like little hints of saturation where the focus of your piece is, that's called saturation contrast. So grayscale shows your value contrast like very well and you don't even have to think about it because it's staring you right in the face. But for me, since I have fun working in color, it's almost taking a lot of the fun out for me. But that's not saying that my way is correct because I know a lot of people that start in color don't understand values and working with values. So I definitely think it's important to find like which path you enjoy doing the most. And if values are something that you might struggle with, I don't recommend working in color right away because then you're actually hurting yourself by not getting a grasp on what um, value, I mean what value really is and how that will help your piece significantly. But that's not to say that uh, you know, value and can only be given, or is the only way of putting contrast in your piece. So just know that you, know, you should have a good combination of value, hue, and saturation contrast within your piece. Um, oh, thank you for sending me the, um, the note for the DA, or for the iDraw girls. Um, link. Now if you take that shape um, line art off, you can definitely see uh, my character that we got going on here. And I'm going to go ahead and keep that shape off, but I'm going to erase some of that hair. Let's see, yeah man, I have so many layers right now. And I think what I'm going to do is if you are a citizen member, you can go ahead and download the final results of this shape challenge. So I'm going to keep every single layer that I have here because right now I know you can't see it on the live stream, but I have like 10 layers. And that's almost a habit. Some might call it a bad habit, but whenever I start on a new area, I'll usually create a new layer. And that's because if I don't like that hair, that layer, not hair, uh, I'll usually go ahead and just delete it rather than having to erase it. But I definitely find that that can be very time consuming and um, it's almost working in fear where you're not you know, confident in what you're going to add, so then you create a new layer. But I actually don't find a problem with it as long as you're not taking, you know, a whole heck of a lot of time, you know, creating new layers and getting lost in how many layers you have. 
All right, so I definitely spent a lot of time working on guy number one, and I definitely want to work on guy number two before this live stream becomes like a two-hour event. So I'm going to go ahead and call this one done for the live stream, but I definitely would work up the different areas of him before I post the final results. But I guess those were just some tips on working with skin contrast, and we're going to be using some of those for guy number two. So I'm going to go ahead and move this around so that you can see both at the same time on the live stream. So let's see here. So it's, it's strange that you can't see any of my Photoshop menus because right now I have like the layers, the brushes, my swatches, and a color picker pulled up, but you guys can't see that. I almost wish that they would show that. All right, so now shape number two. Here we go. So our guy... There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new layer underneath of him. Or no, on top, I'm sorry. And this is something where I've just become more confident working on top of my line art. But I know a lot of artists that like to work underneath of their line art and then kind of work from there. But I've gotten so used to working on top of my line art that it doesn't really bother me anymore. If it's like being covered up. Because, I mean, I can even admit, I don't think my line art is my strongest suit where I think my coloring, or at least I would consider my coloring stronger. So that's why I don't mind covering right over it. Now for him, I definitely want to get that shadow line from the helmet. And, oops. and to do that, I'm just going to grab the darker color and draw right on top of that lighter color and then get that nice cast shadow. And this was actually an exercise that was done, I believe, a few weeks ago. And for his jacket, I'm going to have not so much blue. Let's go for more of a green, like a dirty gray-green. And then just like I did with the first guy, I'll make a new layer in areas that I know I'll be covering up, areas that I don't want to draw over. I'll fill it in, and then using my eraser tool, just erase the areas I don't want, like that. Oh, man, Psychra. Actually, I just started watching his tutorials last week. I knew of him from before, but I never watched any of his tutorials, and I started watching well, not even just his tutorials. I've been watching his interviews and everything, and I really like the way he talks about art, and it, it makes a lot of sense. It's very easy to understand, and he's definitely one of those artists I want to get in contact with and uh, hopefully be able to do something, you know, something collaborative with him, whether, you know, he's being brought into the live stream or I can just do an interview with him and kind of pick his brain. So on that same layer, I'm going to go ahead and draw the helmet over the skin and using that eraser tool. Just like that. So um, if you guys have any other uh, tutorial authors that you watch that you find, you know, that they're really good, definitely give notice to them, um, to me, in an email or in a note or something, and I will do my best to try to get in contact with them and, you know, check out their videos and what they've got. And I just, I find that, you know, not... Every artist has their own way of interpreting interpreting anything of, you know to do with digital art, and it's really interesting to hear other people's. Because I mean, you can hear one artist talk all they want, but it's so much better if you have 
a, you know, a collection of different opinions and suggestions and uh, just having one person you follow, it doesn't really help you all that much. It may help you a little bit, but n not as much as it would if you were following like 10 or more different artists. Now for this area under the helmet here, I'm going to work in this darker gray. Yep, Cynix is another one. Actually, uh, if I could show you my whiteboard right now, there, Cynix and Sykra are the two names on my whiteboard I have um, to email immediately. And of course, you know, I have other artists that I definitely want to get um, more in touch with, like James Zapata. I find his art to be incredible, and I've, I've watched his live streams all the time, and I just... I think he's such a great artist. And unfortunately, like my my absolute favorite artists are usually artists that can't speak English, unfortunately, so I, I couldn't really bring them on unless if I did like a translated interview or something like that. Now for his scarf, this is where we could decide to go either more bold or more subtle because up until this point you can kind of see how his color palette is pretty neutral. I mean the skin colors are somewhat vibrant in a sense and they're giving a lot of that contrast to the colors that we have surrounding it. But let's say, I'm going to do this on a new layer to kind of show you the different examples. If we wanted to make this a bold red color, like that, you can definitely see how it brings a lot of the attention to that red color. And I definitely tend to use red a lot to kind of draw attention to different areas. And that's, I mean, red is my favorite color, if you guys didn't know. But I think red is so powerful and it's demanding. Like, if I then went ahead and then added you know, those more saturated reds on top. And that's really saturated, hold on. Like that. You can really tell how your eye is drawn to those vibrant uh, hues that those reds are laying out. And while that's great and all, you have to kind of decide, do I want the attention being brought down into the scarf? Like, what's the significance of it? And then if I did my hue and saturation slider bar, you could quickly see what it would look like as a different color, what it would look like uh, less saturated and darker or lighter. And you can bring up that menu by pressing Command U. And I believe on a PC it's Control U. Um, but yeah, it's a quick and easy way to see what it would look like at different hues or different saturations. So I'm going to go ahead and keep the red because I love red. So we're going to keep that. And then this would be kind of like my base coloring for this character, just like we did on the first one. I'm going to merge that base color layer together and erase the edging. So it just hit 3 o'clock, so it's been an hour so far. But like I said, I'm going to continue with this character a little farther, like we did the first one, and then call it quits when I feel it hit a certain point of somewhat finished. I don't want to say completely finished, because even the first character I could probably easily pump another half hour. And I say that when, I mean, I'm working pretty slow. Like, if you're trying to, like, speed paint or work really fast, uh, this is definitely a slower way of interpreting each shape. But I definitely find it more relaxing when I'm not, like, on a time 
crunch, and I, I actually think I work more efficiently when I'm not so much um, pressured. Not to say that you should, you know, get comfortable in working slow, but, you know, you definitely feel more uh, relaxed in working with your colors and really making sure it looks uh, not, like, as best as you can make it rather than just trying to get it out and just trying to make it look finished. Um, Feng Zhu is probably my hero in terms of education because I, I really do believe I've seen every single one of his tutorials on YouTube. And his way of explaining things, it's so clear and it makes so much sense. And I, I almost think anyone that wants to be a concept artist or is aspiring to be a concept artist should go check out his videos and watch all of them. Not just the ones that intrigue him, but watch literally all of them. And his understanding of concept art is so great, and the way that he talks about, you know, how to work in concept art and work fast and efficiently and just everything. It's so well done. So, yeah, definitely him I'll definitely try to keep get in touch with. I just know how crazy busy he is, so I... I would just assume it, it'll be a little harder to get someone like Feng Zhu, but you know what? We'll try for him. And his school, I would love to attend his school. I feel like all of his students, if you guys have seen his portfolio reviews of his students, um, from where they started off to where they are currently, I mean, they're always like 100 times better, and um, the kids that come out of his school pretty much get jobs instantly because of how much they improved and what their skill level is at when they leave the school. So like I did with the first guy, I like to draw over my initial outline with a skin color. Ooh, I kind of like the idea of like teeth coming out. I don't know if this is too much like the gorillas. Maybe we'll have those two teeth. Um, I've never heard of Depingo. I would have to check out their live stream. Um, I'm not sure who Steven Silvers is, to be honest. That's another person I'll have to look up. So I want the helmet to look kind of worn and have different bumps in different areas, like little uh, nicks and scratches. So I'm not worrying about making it look perfectly uh, smooth. Like if this was something like that was like brand new helmet, completely finished and make it look pretty, then I would go about rendering it a little different. But for this helmet, I'm going to make it look a little more beat up. And you can kind of see how I jump around when I work. And this is something that I forgot who it was watching, but they talked about letting your instincts kind of take over. So when you're doing a piece, don't worry too much if you're not following like a meticulous analytical order of how you work. Just let your creative side take over and not question it. Like be okay with letting your your you know art side of your brain work. And it, it knows how to do it, but sometimes the logical sense of your head will tell you that you're doing it uh, incorrect and that you have to be following a method of some kind. And that was a, that was all from a live stream I watched recently, or not a live stream, a tutorial I watched recently on being analytical and uh, letting your, in, or being instinctual. That was it. And it was a great tutorial. It's on our Concept Cookie Facebook page if you want to watch it. And it was one that really spoke to me because I definitely think I do try to make the process of creating concept art you know, a process, exactly what that sounds like. And really, 
you can't let everything be so, you know, follow step A through, you know, F to create a perfect looking concept art piece. Sometimes you got to let go and be free with the way that you're working. Yeah, this kid's definitely up to something here. Oh, for uh, schoolism.com. Yeah, I have heard of that. Never mind. I just think it would be really great if we could get some other, other artists that we could do live streams with and then... During that, I could look at your questions and then forward and kind of direct the questions at him so he doesn't have to even look at the questions. And then just hear another artist's perception on concept art and drawing and his process. And I would just love that. All right, now for his eyes, I'm going to work with a darker color. So even if he has like green or blue eyes or even a really light color eyes, in the shadow, they would be, since there isn't that much light being reflected off of the iris, they would look and appear rather dark. And I'm going to give them those hooded eyelids. Actually, this eye looks like he is <laughs> a little too unfocused. So I'm just taking that darker eye color and laying it over the entire eyeball itself. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to have such a light color if it's supposed to be in shadow. Even if the eyeball is supposed to be, you know, that sort of gray looking color. And not white. And I'm really particular about eyes not being white, even with animated characters. And you'll definitely see that, especially with like Ryan Lang and people that work in the industry these days. When they're doing concept art for animated um, characters, and I'm not talking about like simple 2D flat coloring. I'm talking about like uh, characters that look more rendered out, they never use white for the eyeball color, ever. And they should only be using white for like the specularity part of the color, or of the eyeball, where it's directly reflecting the light. And for this character, there wouldn't really be a specular color, because it's all in shadow. But I will add a little tint to the eyeball to give indication that they are green. So I just lightly draw over. You can kind of see the impression that that makes. Um, <laughs> have I ever heard of the Noman Workshop? Yeah, uh, I'm actually, I think I, what did I watch? I watched, I believe it was Noman. They had um, one of the people we interviewed, uh, Cameron Davis is his name, and he did, I believe it was a Noman video, and I watched his whole tutorial on how he created a spider queen, and it was awesome. It was definitely very uh, different than the way I would approach something, because he works... He works very much traditionally, and it's something I respect, the people that will draw on paper first and then scan it in and then work digitally from there. And his tutorial was amazing. And it, I, I believe I've seen two other Nolman videos. Can't remember the artist off the top of the name on my head, but yeah, they are very informative and they're very well done. 
And if you're talking about the actual like classes that you can take, that's a whole other thing completely. So I actually wanted to take, um, it wasn't Nomen, but it's another website called CGMA. And that they have fantastic classes. And one of them is actually, or was taught by Ryan Lang, who I, I've mentioned at least twice now in this live stream. And uh, his, his uh, CGMA class was on coloring and light. So it was something that I was kind of dying to take, but it filled up too fast, and unfortunately I didn't have time anyways uh, with my schedule with Concept Cookie, but I definitely think in the future that is something I w would love to to take. If you're, you're really serious about concept art, I almost see things like that as actually being more important than going to school for concept art, because th from that kind of stuff, you're getting industry experience or you're hearing from someone that has industry experience and literally can have a chat with you one-on-one -on -one about any questions you may have. And I I think that is, like, just incredibly, you know, important for having the class only be $600 compared to the tuition rate of most art schools. You know, and I just, I find that if you're really serious, you would want to take one of those classes to build up your portfolio. Okay, so this kid is looking <laughs> pretty creepy. Uh, something I want to add to him, I just find it to be fitting, is if we added um, a bunch of freckles. So I'm going to go ahead and... I could use a brush, but I'm just going to go ahead and use my circle brush. And if I ever feel like they're too prominent, what you can do is lay the freckles on and then change that layer's opacity lower. And huzzah, you get a better opacity freckle. And right now those eyes look really um, poor to me. So I'm going to just take a little bit of time to fix those up. This is where I might even bring some, like, purple hues and lay it under the eyes. And blend it in with the rest of the skin color I have going on. And it's not supposed to represent makeup in any way, like uh, eyeshadow or whatever that would be. But it's supposed to represent um, how tired he is in the bags that form under your eyes when you don't sleep for the amount of time your body needs. And because you don't want to be afraid of adding colors. So even if you're not sure on if it would look great, why not try it out first? And then if you don't like it, you can always just delete it. You don't have to stick with it. But I find too many people are afraid to try something because they they don't think they'll like it. But if you never try, then you'll never know. And just with the first guy, or like the first guy, I'm going to give a shine on his nose. A little on the outside of the, the nose. And this will add that contrast that I was talking about. And then adding such a lighter color, you'll instinctively, or over time you'll instinctively know that you're adding contrast to it. Not only in hue, but in your value. but I actually think I like the first one better. I think I'm getting a little too lost in um, this character and the way that I'm fleshing out the skin tones. Oops.
So I actually will probably move back onto the first one before I would finish this guy. So it's a lot of problem solving, and that's another thing that I think concept art is, where literally you're looking at something, you're figuring out, okay, I want to make something look like something. So then you take the steps needed to make it look like the way you have a vision in your head. So it is a lot of problem solving that is just constantly ongoing within your head. But then eventually you'll get to a point where you don't even have to ask yourself so much how to go about doing it. You just go. It's almost like your mind just goes on autopilot. All right, so I think I'm going to finish up here soon. And I would probably spend about a half hour more on each character, and it would just go through rendering more, doing the fine rendering, like we did on this first guy. Like, this area looks pretty finished to me, and I would just, you know, continue to push that kind of quality throughout the rest of it. And the same with the second character. I'd probably work more on the second character on making his face look not so... Um, it it just doesn't feel all that awesome to me. And you'll have that with some pieces where you're, you're really digging something. And this is actually goes back to what we were talking about before, where the first guy I actually really like. The way that he's looking, and the second character, uh, not so much. So I would just go back, and um, maybe I wouldn't even come back to him till tomorrow, but I would come back to it with a new mindset. It's a different day. Let's go ahead and do the best I can on this character. Oh, that's what he needed. He needed an eyebrow. I think that helps. Because all in all, just remember that something like this is supposed to be fun. And if you're not having fun, then it just becomes almost like a pain. And then you become slower, you're not as involved in the character, and you're not quite as on point as you would as if you were having fun. So sometimes if you just need to take a break, even if it's like a half hour, you know, walk away from it, do something. Um, even maybe just work on the next shape, whatever you're, or whatever it is you're working on, just move on to whatever else you have in front of you, come back to it later, and then maybe then you'll be more inspired and more in tune with making it look nicer. I'm just going to lastly finish this off with the teeth here. I'm going to add a little shadow underneath. There we go. So now I would zoom out, see what they look like from afar. So I'm really digging the way the first guy is looking. The second guy will need a little more love, which I will definitely uh, work on. And who knows? Who knows what they will end up looking like for the final, but 
yeah, I think I'm going to cut off the live stream here. I want to thank you guys for coming to it. I know that it's been a little different with Google Hangout rather than Twitch, but I want to thank you guys for making that transition a little simpler, and hopefully over time we'll get used to the, um, what is it, the commenting section rather than it being, you know, a live conversation, it's a Q&A, and, a. and I, I know I like it where, you know, the newer comments come in the bottom rather than me having to scroll, because even right now I'm actually looking through the comments and there's like five that I didn't even see before. So, yeah, I will look through all your comments, and I will write down all the artists that you wrote down for me. So I want to thank you guys for checking out this live stream. We do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m., and that's central time, but that's minus 6 uh, GMT, so if you live around the world. And they're usually an hour, depending on what the subject matter is. Next week, we'll actually be taking a look at the next two shapes in our... Uh, shape challenge, and I already have an idea for this one. It'll be a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you guys are here next week for the second half of the shape challenge, and I hope within this live stream you learn something uh, taken away from when we drew these two guys. So thanks again. I uh, look forward to a new tutorial series uh, by Tyler Edlin soon, and hopefully we'll get some bigger names from... Uh, you know, around these people that you're giving me from my own artists that I follow and I really appreciate and respect. And maybe we'll get them on the live stream. So, you know, stay tuned for updates on what we'll be doing with that. So thank you guys, and thank you for checking out this live stream. And hopefully we'll see you next week. All right, bye, guys.